I'm going to give you a little, a slightly different perspective than what you've had so far this morning. Um, as was mentioned, um, I am currently a pork producer uh, farming in eastern Iowa with my family. Um, served as president of the Iowa Pork Producers Association a couple of years ago, so I'm, in some ways I'm representing the interests of all, all producers in the state of Iowa. Um, before I came back to the farm, though, I had a career as a research scientist uh, working on bacterial genomics. So if you want to if you want to talk pig genomics, that I can I can hold a 10 minute conversation about that. If you want to talk mycobacterial genomics, then we can talk for a few hours, probably. All right. So just to, so you can get the lay of the land here. Um, here's uh, the most recent data that's available for hogs and pigs inventory in the United States as of 2017. So you can see that uh, Iowa here, I'm right here in the eastern part of Iowa, but the state of Iowa is the epicenter of pork production in the United States. Each, each dot here represents uh, 20,000 hogs and pigs. So, so you can see that it's concentrated in Iowa and the surrounding states. Uh, there are a few clusters elsewhere, uh, notably um, here in North Carolina, that would be where uh, a lot of Smithfield's production is. Um, but the vast majority is located here in the Midwest um, for the simple fact that that's where the food to feed the pigs is grown. So that's where the pigs have ended up. Um, a little more specifically about Iowa. Uh, Iowa is a very heavily agricultural state, if you aren't familiar with it. Um, over 85% of the land is used for agriculture. Average farm size is 355 acres, but that's getting bigger all the time as there are fewer and fewer farmers and the farmer farms that do um, survive are, are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, over 5,000 pig farms from which 48 million hogs are marketed annually. So that's number one in the United States. Um, 2.5 billion bushels of corn uh, are produced every year in the state. Um, which is also first in the nation. Um, as I mentioned, um, it takes a lot of corn and soybeans um, to feed those pigs. So uh, I think Iowa is number two in soybean production, but over 40% of all the corn and soybeans produced in Iowa will go to feed livestock, of which hogs are probably half of that. Um, and, and Iowa exports $10.3 billion worth of agricultural exports every year. That's second to California, but about probably about 2 billion of that is pork. Uh, so dialing it in a little bit here, this is uh, our farm um, or one of our farms. This is what we call the home farm. This is uh, my great, great, great grandfather came over from Germany and started this farm in the mid 1850s. Um, you can't really see it on here. The oldest structure on the farm would be the house that that, that ancestor built when he came over from Germany. It's hidden there in the trees. Uh, the, the newest addition would probably be the solar panels here. Um, but what I wanted to show you here is um, our farm is, I would say, is pretty typically representative of, of what pork production looks like in most of the United States now. Um, just in my lifetime, we've moved all our pigs indoors. Um, and that's what you see these barns here that have feed bins outside of them. Um, these are all, in this case, these are all nursery barns. So these are pigs get weaned and go into here for about 40 days, and then they get moved to a different farm into a, a finishing barn. Uh, all produce, well, for the most part, I say all, but there are some still niche production that's done outdoors, but most producers have moved production indoors now. Uh, in Iowa, especially, it's um, these barns are all climate controlled. Um, in the winter, it can be minus 20 Celsius. In the summer, it can be 38 degrees Celsius. So we have extremes of weather there, and it, it's more efficient and effective to, to keep the, the animals indoors where uh, the temperature can be more closely regulated. Um, so I'm the sixth generation of postions to farm on the farm. I've got the last four generations are pictured here. This would be my grandfather, my father, and then this is my family. So my kids would represent the seventh generation. And I put this up here just to, to try to start driving home the point that um, we often have a very nostalgic view of farms and farming. It's kind of locked back into kind of the 1950s pastoral view. But in reality, modern farms are rapidly adapting and adopting technology. 
Um, and we have uh, kind of an, an example here, just my grandfather's no longer living, but in, in his lifetime, he went from farming with horses to using uh, 400 horsepower tractors that drive themselves using GPS guidance. Um, so here, my, my dad's on an older tractor that he would have used when he was a boy that's been restored that we don't really use anymore except to have fun with. Um, but this, just, just to illustrate just in one lifespan how, how, uh, how far we've come, farmers have shown over and over that they're willing to quickly and rapidly adopt technology that solves problems that they're having. This, is, this has happened more so on the crop side than on the livestock side. It's been lagging there. Um, so if you want to talk on crop genetics, uh, 30 years ago, uh, 40 years ago, uh, we grow, you know, no uh, genetically modified crops. Now it's 100% um, as far as corn and soybeans go. So uh, when the technology exists, when consumers accept it, when it solves a problem for farmers, um, they're going to very rapidly and quickly adopt it. Um, just a little perspective on how genetics are used on production farms. So generally, um, you're going to use, uh, most farms are using two maternal lines that they will cross with each other. It could be a land race and a large white, and then there'll be a terminal line. Um, in this case, let's say it's a Duroc. So potentially three genetic lines. Um, no, for the most part, um, again, this is the vast majority of commercial production is completely AI now. You know, we just heard about on the beef side. Well, on the on the pork side, um, AI has been adopted for quite a few years now so that, um, you know, it, it makes no sense to to do natural mating. It's it's a, a inefficient use of bore power and genetics. Um, and so on the hog side, we've had a complete transition to that. On our farm, some a lot of farms will still bring breeding females onto the farm. Uh, we've made the decision on ours to keep the herd completely closed. So we only bring semen into the farm. The, there was a transition there where we would buy boars and have a boar on site that we would collect and then, and then AI. But even that doesn't make sense anymore because the pace of genetic progress is so fast. You, it makes no sense to buy a boar because in six to 12 months, there's going to be another boar that's much more efficient, much more effective than that boar. And so um, what's developed is basically you have boar studs where the boars are housed generally away from where other major production centers are for biosecurity purposes. The boars are rotated through there every six to 12 months. If they have higher testing boars come in, then they're replaced and that's the semen that's going out. So that's that's kind of what the industry looks like right now. Uh, so core selection traits. Um, one of my daughters is uh, red hair. She would say a core selection trait, should we should make all the pigs red because that's her favorite. Uh, I don't think that uh, that's marketable right now, but who knows in the future, maybe. Um, but these are the big three, average daily gain, feed conversion, mortality. Um, these are what um, most of the modern genetics companies, what their programs have been developed around. They're very good at measuring this, testing it, improving it. Um, this is what pays the bills at the end of the day. This is what producers need. We, we need a pig that will grow quickly. We need a pig that can efficiently convert feed to muscle. And we need a pig that's not going to drop dead on us. So um, these, these are kind of the, the base that everything else is built around. And these are the things that we, we can't give up much, if anything, here um, in order to gain in other areas or, or um, producers won't be uh, economically sustainable. So some of the challenges that are facing the swine industry, um, I threw up, <laughs> basically I looked, I looked for the uh, packaging that had the most uh, claims on it that I possibly could. And if you'll indulge me on a little sidebar here, this is a good example of how ridiculous it's gotten. And, you know, we wonder why consumers are con are confused about their food, right? When we're throwing this stuff at them, you know, pork raised with no antibiotics and growth hormones. Well, considering it's illegal to give growth hormones to pigs, they, you know, they should all be free of any added growth hormones, but they all have hormones, but good luck explaining that to a consumer. Um, 
you know, humanely raised, uh, gluten-free. Uh, last time I checked, uh, that's pretty easy with a meat product, but, you know, who knows? Um, you know, 100% vegetarian feed, gestation crate-free, and, the, you know, we've even got carbon zero. But if you read the fine print, made by a carbon-neutral company, well, so, yeah, so are they really carbon neutral or they just bought some carbon credits so they could put another claim on there. So anyway, a lot of, a lot of consumer demands on the industry, um, but a lot of producer um, challenges that, that they would like to see solved too. Disease is always the big one. Um, disease and price volatility are the two biggest things that have driven producers um, out of the livestock industry. Uh, and that's it's led to a uh, uh, you could call it an undiversification of farming. It used to be all farms had livestock. Now more and more we have just crop farmers because they can't handle the risk and challenges of on the livestock side. And disease is one of those big ones. Uh, sustainability. We're, we're constantly being asked to do more with less, use fewer resources um, to produce uh, pork. We're on our farm, we've um, participated in some programs to try to measure um, that. And we know that we are, we are pre getting pretty darn close to having a carbon neutral uh, pork uh, produced on our farm and a lot of other farms like that. Uh, welfare, that's another big concern for producers and consumers. How do we best take care of the animals? How can we make improvements to how they're being cared for in the future? and then antibiotic usage. Uh, again, consumers have told us they want fewer antibiotics used. It makes sense to use fewer antibiotics if possible. I don't wanna completely throw that out of the toolbox. Antibiotics are still a useful tool, but anything we can do to minimize the usage um, is, is uh, an improvement. And obviously, if a pig doesn't get sick in the first place, then we don't need to treat it with antibiotics. So as far as some additional traits, um, uh, my other daughter, one of the traits she would ask for is that pigs just stay small and cute for their entire lives. But again, uh, I fail to see an economic path forward for that. Um, heat tolerance, you know, we're increasing, increasingly seeing um, more widespread changes in, in the weather, um, greater periods of, of high heat when animals are not growing as uh, efficiently. So any kind of heat tolerance that we could breed in, uh, disease resistance or resilience. Some of this is in the pipeline already, but even if we can't identify a specific genes for resistance to a particular pathogen, the ability to just build in general resilience in the face of a challenge is, is a huge improvement. You know, We want animals that can shrug off uh, challenges, whether it's from the environment or from the disease. Uh, behavior changes. As, as we try new production methods with animals, we, we sometimes learn that we need to make modifications in, in behavior. Um, you talk to any farmer and he can tell you, you kind of quickly find out if there are two different breeds or even two different lines of the same breed of hog that have enough of a difference in, in aggression you don't want to put those animals in the same pen because the more aggressive animal will will um, dominate the less aggressive animals. And so, you know, that's that's another area where there's there's obvious dis differences that exist. And so, how can we um, target that in a in a uh, coordinated approach? Uh, meat quality. We always want the consumer to have a good eating experience. Some would say we went too far on leanness in pigs and and breeding uh, for leanness. And so now there's been a, maybe a little bit of a shift the other way to, okay, maybe we need to have a little more fat in there just from an uh, eating experience standpoint. Um, and there are other color, pH, things like that, other measurements that we're still trying to get a handle on, but would be good targets for for targeted um, genetic um, progress there. And then finally, nutrient utilization, um, making, allowing, helping the pigs make better use of the nutrients in their diet. Um, that, can, that can be from an animal biotech standpoint. It could also be from a metagenomic standpoint. All right, um, and just wanted to throw this in here as well, functional annotation. Obviously, we've had the whole genome sequence uh, for pigs for a number of years now, 
but the reality is, you know, we're still wandering through a dark forest. We don't know, you know, what a lot of these genes do. Many of these traits are polygenic, so it's hard to pinpoint exactly what all the genes are involved that might be contributing to a particular phenotype. These are where some of these targeted genetic techniques like gene editing can play a role on the research side to help us start to narrow down you know, what might be the proper targets to put into a breeding program or what might be the proper edits to use in a line to get a desired phenotype. And then one final um, thought I wanted to leave you with, um, we're, we're providing pork to a global market um, from, from Iowa. Iowa produces about one third of the pork that's produced in the United States and about one third of the pork from the United States is exported. And so you can see uh, Japan and Mexico are always uh, top of the list for our um, export destinations. Uh, China will come in and be at the top of the list and then they'll be at the bottom of the list sometimes depending on uh, what their needs are. Um, but after, after you get past uh, those big three, then you can see we've uh, Canada, obviously another neighbor um, for us, but then you see uh, Southeast Asia and South America are additional big markets. And the reason I put this in here is, is to, to just talk about the idea of when we're talking about regulating um, some of these new uh, genetic techniques, we really need uh, a somewhat uniform regulation across multiple countries because the way the production system is set up, most packers are not equipped to to segregate pigs with a you know that are say gene edited from pigs that are not, and and even if they were set up, um, would they even be able to detect you know how would they able be able to tell if an animal has been gene edited or if it just has that natural trait. And so, you know, so the more that we can work towards a coordinated framework um, for regulation, um, the easier it's going to be for the industry to adopt. Because right now, you know, the pigs that we sell to the packer end up all over the world from our farm. And so it's, it's, not, um, it's not something that can easily be separated in the, in the food chain at this time. Um, that may change in the future, but that is a consideration. Right, so just in summary, um, producers are desiring um, rapid genetic progress. We, we're getting that to some degree with a conventional breeding program, but obviously it could be even faster and more targeted with the use of some of these new uh, genetic techniques. And, and producers have shown time and time again that they are willing to rapidly adopt um, these new technologies um, if it can um, be a, a benefit and help solve production problems. Uh, new traits are needed, right? In some cases, we talked about disease being a big issue. Uh, we just, there aren't naturally occurring disease resistance traits in some cases that are useful for some of the disease challenges that we face. So those are going to be, have to be created. They can't be just bred in um, from another uh, line. Uh, trade considerations we just talked about. And just one final thought, the, the whole idea around um, regulation based on the type of modification. Obviously, doing a lateral gene transfer where you're taking something out of one species and putting it into another is a very different situation than doing a gene edit where you're just truncating part of a receptor on a cell. And so hopefully, uh, you know, regulatory frameworks can reflect um, the, and balance that out um, between the, the different types of, of uh, genetic modification that exists and rather than just kind of a one size fits all thing. So thank you for your time and I uh, look forward to the continued conversation.